Miracy. Long, long ago, in the time of lords and ladies, castles and kings, monsters and dragons and magical rings, there was one who told, to young and old, tales of all these things. The tale-teller travelled from village to village with his leather satchel over his shoulder, telling tales in exchange for a hot meal and a place to sleep, and perhaps a new tale or two with him when he left. For tales are meant to be shared. If they're not, they crumble into dust. Hi, I'm Lisa Bloom, the story coach, and you're listening to Once Upon a Business. In each episode, we explore a story, a fairy tale, folk tale, or traditional story, so that we can discover the amazing lessons relevant for business and for entrepreneurs. Among the listeners was a young maiden, a peasant girl, who was collecting food in her apron for her sister lying sick in bed at home. They lived alone, their parents having died. When the tale teller entered the hall, The people cheered, tell us a story, tell us a story. The old man smiled and set his leather satchel down on a table. He opened it, and those who were nearest could see it was filled to the brim with polished stones. I've prepared a new one for you, he said, and picked up a stone from the top. Grasping it in his right hand, he pressed it against his heart, closed his eyes, and took a long, slow breath. He opened his eyes. Once upon a time, there dwelt a father and three sons, he began. His hand never left his heart. The listeners leaned forward, hardly breathing, not wanting to miss a word. It was a story of thrilling adventure, and when the tale-teller finished, the listeners cheered. The tale-teller took the stone away from his heart and replaced it in the satchel. Another, another, the people shouted, a funny one. Here's one you'll like, said the tale teller, choosing a small red stone from the satchel. He placed it over his heart as before. One day, in the forest, a fox met a bear. Soon the listeners were weak with laughter. When the tale teller finished, they shouted, Another, another! Do you have a love story? asked a young couple nearby. The tale teller smiled and said, Of course! He reached into the satchel and pulled out a silver stone shaped like a teardrop. A long time ago, there lived three sisters. As he told this tale, tears formed in the eyes of the listeners, for the lovers had to undergo many trials to test their love. But there was one listener whose eyes were not wet. This man was a thief, and he had come to the feast for the free food, not the stories. But when he saw the silver stone, his interest in this tale-teller grew. Easily, like a snake, He slithered through the crowd until he stood beside the table where the satchel lay. His practiced eyes scanned the stones within. These were no ordinary stones. He would have to have a jeweler appraise them, of course, but he'd be willing to wager that he was looking at carnelians, opals, jade, amber, and other semi-precious stones. He hadn't even noticed that the tale-teller had finished his tale. The old man set the teardrop-shaped stone in the satchel right before the thief's eyes. It was solid silver. A stone like that would bring a good price, thought the thief, and waited for his chance. Suddenly it came. My friends, I must go refresh my thirst. I will return shortly, said the tale-teller. He left his satchel still open on the table. The thief snatched the silver stone and slipped it into the leather bag that hung from his belt. He glanced around, grabbed a handful of other stones and slithered into the night. The tale-teller, returning with a frosty tankard, saw him go. He stroked his beard and sighed. Soon the thief arrived at the home of a jeweller. What would you give me for this, he asked, reaching into his pouch, feeling the largest stone. He pulled it out. Nothing, said the jeweller. Common stones such as this can be found alongside any road. What, said the thief? He peered at the stone in the candlelight. He could have sworn it was silver, but now it looked like any ordinary rock. He turned the pouch over and dumped out all the stones. Every one of them was a common pebble. I don't understand, said the thief, in the tale-teller's hands these stones were different. Ah, so that's what happened, said the jeweller. These are story stones. They can't be sold. Did you listen to the stories? The thief shook his head. Without the stories, they're completely worthless, said the jeweller. Go on your way. I'm going to bed. 
Back at the hall, the tale teller had returned, and the listeners were again begging for a tale. What to tell? His eyes scanned the room and met the eyes of a young maiden with an apron full of food. I know what she needs to hear, he thought. Ah, here's the perfect stone. A heart-healing tale. In a certain time, in a certain place, there lived a peasant girl. His eyes never left those of the maiden. She needs this story, he realized. She needs this story even more than I do. When the tale was done, the girl moved through the crowd until she stood before him. Would you come to my house and tell my sister that story, she begged. He looked at her a moment, then picked up the stone again and placed it in her hand. I think you need to be the one to tell it, he said. The girl hurried home with her apron full of food and the stone clutched tightly in her hand. Her sister was lying in bed, feverish and weak. I've brought you something wonderful, said the girl, opening her hand. Oh no, this was a plain, ordinary rock. Quickly, she closed her hand to hide it. She would have to pretend. She placed her hand over her heart and took a deep breath. Suddenly, her mind was flooded with images, feelings, everything that had been in the story. In a certain time, in a certain place, there lived a peasant girl. She stumbled over some of the words, but the images remained and she found new words. Her eyes never left her sister. When she finished, her sister's face was radiant. Oh, what a beautiful story. Could you tell it again? Of course. The girl put the stone over her heart again and again the images washed over her. The words came easier this time. This is better nourishment than food, said her sister. Again, please. Through the night... The story was told again and again, each time more smoothly. When the morning sun came through their window, it shone on two sleeping girls, and in the hand of one of them was a stone of bright, shining gold. This is a beautiful story written by Leslie Slape and told with her permission. It really describes the magical tradition of storytelling, the main source of entertainment in the olden days, and the great respect that was given to stories and storytelling. I've always been drawn to that sense of magic. It speaks to this beautiful space created within the story experience, where anything can happen, and the boundaries between reality and imagination become blurred. In the context of business, I imagine the entrepreneur as the storyteller with the ability to create something wonderful and magical from the simplest of things. In the story, the stones are transformed into precious stones by the embedding of story. It's like the entrepreneur who creates something brand new and beautiful from nothing. The story speaks very clearly to the healing power of story. At first, it's a general kind of healing. The audience asks for certain types of stories and then is soothed by the story that is told. Then it becomes more personal. The young lovers who request a story and the whole audience is moved to tears by the story that he chooses. And the storyteller chooses a story that answers the request but goes beyond this. It soothes the soul of the listener. And then he identifies the person that needs the story. The young peasant girl, the story says. She needs it even more than he does. It's such an interesting idea that we should need a story more than someone else. And it's a concept that really resonates for me. I remember many years ago telling stories at a school and I was telling stories to groups, 15 or 20 youngsters, you know, 16, 17 year olds would come in at a time and then they'd move on to their next activity. In the first group, there was a young woman, I noticed a young girl, and she sat very quietly on the other side of the room. She had a hoodie on and her jacket was zipped right up. And she seemed to be kind of listening, but maybe not. She didn't say a word and she didn't seem to respond. But when the group finished, she left. And when the next group arrived, she was back in that group. And I remember she sat right beside me. And I was telling a bunch of stories. But when I got to one particular story, I noticed that the reaction of the group was different to what I was used to. I realized that they weren't quite paying attention and that they were somehow distracted. And then I realized that they weren't looking at me. They were looking at the girl who was sitting beside me. And out of the corner of my eye, I noticed that she was imitating me. 
my first reaction was to get angry. I was, I was annoyed. Like, who was she to make a fool of me in front of all these people? And I really took it personally. I was kind of angry. But I remembered in that moment a story that a storyteller had once told me of his experience about this idea that sometimes people need stories. And I realized in that moment that that girl needed something from this story. She had come again. She had stayed with me. There was something she needed in this story experience. I remember I turned around to her. My initial reaction was to want to throw her out, to get rid of her, to somehow salvage my ego that she was making fun of me. But instead, remembering what the storyteller had told me, I turned around to her and I said, oh, I see we have another storyteller in the room. And I looked at her and smiled and I said to her, maybe you can help me tell the story. And she said, oh, no, 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 I can't do that. And I said, no, please, what happens next? And then she said the next line of the story. And then I continued the story. And then I turned to her and said, and then? And she continued the story. And so at the end, when she completed the story, everybody just gave this huge round of applause. And it was all for her. And I thanked her. I thanked her so much for helping me tell the story. And in that moment, I realized she needed that story. She needed that story so much more than I did. I think that's the case with stories. They have this healing quality. Sometimes we just need to either tell or hear a story in order to be able to move forward. In many kinds of businesses that we run, our clients need something that we can provide. Sometimes we need to choose the way the service is delivered, the format, just like the storyteller chooses the story. And often we go beyond just the provision of the service, but actually we're in the business of healing the souls of our clients. It's not spoken about so much in the entrepreneurial world, and yet there is this deeper soul level of service, a spiritual level, that's so much a part of what we do. So one of the things that's interesting about this story is that the stones only have value because of the stories, the stories that are told with the stones held to your heart. It's kind of similar to how so many entrepreneurs are concerned that they are that they're no different to others who are perhaps working in their area, that they may be in a saturated niche and they wonder how to differentiate themselves. And they forget that their own stories, their own experience is the differentiator, that their clients are drawn to them because of their style, their personality, but because of their story. And so when we're presented with someone that we might want to work with, and it doesn't feel right. Maybe the chemistry isn't right. Maybe there's something about the interaction that isn't right. Usually it's because their story doesn't really resonate with us. And so as a consumer or as somebody who's buying a service, we need to really pay attention to that resonance, pay attention to what we're hearing and what we're feeling when we interact with somebody who wants to provide a service. But as a service provider, we need to trust that our story and how we show up is going to attract the right people. And that in fact, it's the story, it's who we are that turns the stone into something really precious. It turns what we do into the most precious and perfect thing for that client. When the girl brings the stone home and shows it to her sister, the first thing she sees is that it's just a simple stone. And instead of questioning, oh my goodness, what is it that he's given me? Or how do I do this? Or throwing it away, she immediately pretends. She holds the stone to her heart and she does what the storyteller did. And as she pretends, she evokes all the images of the story and it comes back to her and she's able to share it. And so each time she shares the story, it becomes closer to what she remembers hearing and it comes alive. I think it's fascinating that at the end of the night, she ends up with this perfect stone of gold. It's made of gold. It's been turned into something really precious. It reminds me of the journey of the entrepreneur who oftentimes needs to start with something that's not proven or not clear, and perhaps sometimes they might even doubt its value. And yet when they keep telling and keep trying and keep presenting it to the world and iterating perhaps, but keep on telling that story, keep on offering that service to the world, that's what turns it into gold at the end. I think it's a perfect metaphor for that. When we keep going, sometimes 
we share something that we're not quite sure of, but we believe on some level, just as the young girl believed in herself, she believed in the storyteller and the story and the stone. She believed it so much that she almost willed it into being. I think sometimes that's the entrepreneurial journey that we're not quite sure and we want to believe it into being. So we keep going, we keep trying. And ultimately it does become that amazing, precious stone, that amazing, precious service or offering. I mentioned that there's this almost hidden spiritual side of the work that we can sometimes do in how we can, as I said, like soothe the soul of our clients. And I think there's an element of faith that comes through in this story. The little girl makes a choice to tell the story from a place of faith. She believes in herself. She believes in the stone, the storyteller, and the power of the story. And with that faith, she tells it into being. That speaks to me of oftentimes the tenacity that we need to show as business owners and as entrepreneurs, the tenacity of believing our business into being, that we will do anything to figure out how to make it work. And that faith is something that when we doubt it or when we lack it, it becomes very difficult to actually get our work out into the world. And I think that we can find inspiration and we can find guidance on that faith from places like stories, whether it's the kind of stories I share here, or whether it's the stories of other entrepreneurs who have gone the path, or whether it's the stories of people who inspire us and people who have done great things. And I don't mean great, you know, world-changing, impactful things. I'm not talking about the grand heroes of society. I'm talking about the people in our lives that we admire, the people who come forward with kindness and with service and with creativity. And we all have people like that in our lives. They're the people who give us faith to keep moving forward in our work so that we can get our work out into the world. I think it's really important to remember that that input of inspiration, that focus of creativity and faith is all around us. We just need to reach out and find it and then take it into our hearts like we hold the stone to our hearts. It's almost the same thing. We hold our sources of inspiration to our hearts and it helps us move forward. I'm Lisa Bloom and you've been listening to Once Upon a Business. You can find out more about me at story-coach.com. That's story-coach.com. Once Upon a Business is part of the Miracy FM podcast network, which also includes such shows as Making It and Course Lab. This episode of Once Upon a Business was produced by Cynthia Lamb. Jeff Govertson assembled the episode. Danny Inney is our executive producer. Post-production was by Post Office Sound. So you don't miss the episodes that are coming up on Once Upon a Business. Please follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. And if you like the show, please leave us a starred review. It really does help us out. Thank you. We'll see you next time.